So last time we ended with this slide, and I said this would be the final slide for the exam. So metaphase involves these microtubules, which attach to that kinetochore, which are a bunch of proteins that hang out around the centromeres. We have two different types of microtubules, or, my, or mitotic spindles. We have the ones that are going to move the chromosomes. We also have the ones that are non-kinetochore associated, and they're just going to shove the two ends far apart. Hooray and hip hip. Moving on to stuff that will be on the final. Final is not cumulative. You're going to find it's more than enough what we're doing right now. You don't need it to be a cumulative final to make it challenging. The spindle turns out to be complicated. And the way that the spindle shortens is actually really weird. So for reasons, did Dr. Holland tell you about how microtubules form and fall apart? Or did she just say, yeah, they're there and they move stuff? They're there. Yeah, they're there and they move stuff? Yay. So it turns out, yeah, they're there, they move stuff. They also build and then disappear. And they do so in a very particular manner. It turns out that the centrosomes are where you can start building microtubules. And it turns out at the kinetochore is where they fall apart. So the weird thing that happens during anaphase, when we rip apart the sister chromatids, is at the kinetochore, the microtubule, as it's going through shaky motion, it actually falls apart. So it's actually dissociating right here, and we still remain latched on. So it actually is literally falling apart here, and it's being drugged along the remaining microtubule. So when they shorten, they're falling apart at the chromosome. They don't shorten out at the centrosomes, which is just a weird little quirk about microtubules. There's also going to be a whole bunch of motor proteins that you'll learn about in 340 that are involved that are going to help drag them along. And they'll also help with the pushing and pulling. But the point is, it's not as simple as, oh, they just yank. Because they need to fall apart to do the yank. And the falling apart part, falling apart part, yeah, occurs at the chromosomes in, themselves. So it's disintegrating at the grip point. So you have to constantly be changing your grip. Which, again, is kind of weird, but also kind of a little bit fascinating at the exact same time. Cleavage is the splitting of the cell. We typically only drop this word when we talk about animals. And in animals, this is going to be due to actin and myosin. So I don't know if any of you have taken a physiology class in your past, but actin and myosin are the proteins involved in muscle contraction. So all your skeletal muscles, actually, and heart muscles and smooth muscle, when they contract, they use this pair of proteins, actin and myosin. And what we get at the metaphase plate is a ring of actin and myosin. So the way that we actually split the cell in half and make this little dent called a cleavage furrow is you get a muscle contraction. It just squeezes and pinches them apart, kind of like you're making mozzarella. It's exactly the same thing. Plants don't do this. Plants instead have little vesicles that contain primary or proto-cell wall parts. And these vesicles line up in the exact same plane, so in the exact same metaphase plate. And then they just fuse together. We call that a fragmoplast because we fragment the cell. And it actually just forms a wall from the inside out. Both of these, like I said, occur at the metaphase plate. And in 340, you're going to learn how they actually know where it is. And it has to do with the kinetochore. The kinetochore kind of like marks its location. And it tells other cell parts, hey, you might want to come here later on. So animals, we do the split. Plants, we build a wall in the center of the cell. Main difference. Both splits occur at the metaphase plate. 
which means the cell needs to know where the metaphase plate is. So at what stage of mitosis is responsible for ensuring the daughter cells are clones to each other? Clones meaning they are identical to each other. What is that key stage? So let's talk something similar, yet not similar. That's meiosis. What we're going to see in meiosis are two things, not just one. First thing we're going to see are homologous chromosomes recombining, then separating. Then we're going to see sister chromatids separate. This is going to result in genetically distinct haploid daughter cells, and we call those haploid daughter cells gametes. All of the words all over the place. When we look at most eukaryotic organisms, we typically see that your chromosomes are paired up, meaning you're going to have a maternal set of chromosomes and a paternal set of chromosomes. We call that being the diploid state or being 2N. And those pairs are what we call homologous chromosomes. Visually, the way that we could tell them that they're homolo homologs or homologous chromosomes is they're the same shape and same size is the visual cue that we have. Normally, we can't see that they're the same. We only see that they're the same during mitosis. Mitosis is when we can actually tell where the homologs are or the homologous pairs. I keep alternating back and forth between saying homologous pair and homolog. Same thing. It's just if I want to use two words versus one word. The reason why I say most eukaryotes is because the fungi... They look at this and they go, nah. Fungi are weird. They are just weird. So I listen to really nerdy podcasts because look at me. And one of the things that people are freaking out about with climate change is fungi typically don't like body temperatures. That's why we don't get lots of fungal infections because they're not comfortable with our body temperature. If we're heating up the world, we're eliminating the fungi that don't like warm temperatures. And we're only leaving the ones that like warm body temperatures. Fungal infections are lethal if you get them. And we're seeing an increase in fungal pathogens. I'm not saying Last of Us is real, but maybe. Wouldn't be to that extent, but fungal pneumonias, fungal meningitis, fungal lung infections, they're on the rise. So those weirdo fungi, they got something figured out. When we say, or when I say a complete set, what I mean is you have every single possible chromosome that could exist. So in us humans, our complete set of chromosomes would be numbered 1 through 22, and then either an X or a Y. That would be considered a complete set. To be considered diploid, you need to have 1 through 22, X or Y, then another 1 through 22, X or Y. It's not mix and match till you get the right number. It's you need the complete set. Every once in a while, you might be able to tolerate having an extra one or missing one, but that's an exception to the rule. If you have only one complete set, so half of that diploid number, we call that being haploid or single end. So if I were to look at this cell here, I count one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes in there. So the diploid number is six. The haploid number is half of it, three. The haploid number also tells you the number of pairs. So I have one, two, three pairs of chromosomes in there.
when we look at organisms, they can either undergo asexual reproduction, that's mitosis, or they can go through a recombination version where they're trying to increase genetic variation and that's going to be a sexual life cycle. There are three major sexual life cycles that exist and just then a matter of how complicated do you wish to make it. Animals spend most of our existence being diploid. So most of us turn out to be diploid. We only, we animals only will produce at most one type of haploid cell and it stays as a single cell. And they're only used for the purposes of fertilization. In us, we call them sperm and egg. Fungi, like I said, they're the weirdos, they're mainly haploid. They only fuse together when the times are bad, and then they will form a zygote, then immediately make haploid cells again, and then spend most of their existence as haploids. You also will see this with some of the protists. We'll do this. Plants are the weirdos. Plants make structures that are diploid, and they make structures that are haploid. This phenomenon, where they kind of make two different body types, is called the alternation of generations. And depending on where you're looking, will determine if you're seeing the diploid form or the haploid form. If you're looking at a flowering plant at an angiosperm, you're most likely looking at the diploid form. Unless you're carving open the flower, and if you're carving open the flower and you're looking inside of an ovule, then you will find a multicellular haploid structure in there that's referred to as the female gametophyte. And if you take a pollen grain and slice that open and look inside, you see a multicellular haploid structure that we call the male gametophyte. If you look at moss, on the other hand, so moss is that little green stuff that's on the ground that most people don't even notice exists. If any of you are taxonomy types and you want to get a species named, like you get to want be the person to name it, study mosses. No one studies mosses. So anywhere you go, you're probably going to find a moss no one has ever heard of before. Congratulations, you get to name it. It's how the rules work. If you look at mosses, what you're staring at with a moss is actually the haploid structure. And they make a very brief diploid structure. So if you look at moss, which you normally see is this stuff down here, and then there'll sometimes be a little sprout that looks like it has like a little hook on it. This is the diploid part. This is the haploid part. That shaky cam thing is so, I don't like that. So plants are kind of weird. If you look at this and you go, what freakish thing is this? This haploid, diploid, alternation of generations? The catch is, in both of those, or in all three of those cases, we have a process called meiosis. So, meiosis as a word turns out to mean something. So, M E I means a reduction, meaning we're going to see something get smaller or we're going to see something decrease in number. Kind of like mitosis was that weird cell condition where you, we see threads. Meiosis means we're going to make something smaller. When we look at meiosis, it comes in two phases. The first one is what we call meiosis one. So because I'm using a sans serif font, I speak nerd, if you haven't noticed. A serif are these little flary things. Sans means without, so it doesn't have little flary things. So that thing that looks like an L is a capital I. It's a Roman numeral. So for meiosis, we use Roman numerals to say ones and twos. It's annoying, I know. So in meiosis one, what we're going to do is we're going to separate those homologous chromosomes, which is kind of weird. And then in meiosis two, we're going to separate the sister chromatids. 
Oh, just separating sister chromatids. That's mitosis. Yeah. So meiosis is kind of like doing mitosis twice, except the first part's a little jacked up. But it's still going to look kind of sort of similar. It's just going to be the second part that you can say, oh, I recognize that. I, I, I got that one figured out. What we think in evolutionary history is meiosis one was a mistake. It was like an added, oops, we added an extra step. But by adding this extra step, we got a pleasant outcome, which is recombinations. We got a shuffling of genes. When did it happen? Not a clue. Because again, it's just what we kind of think would be the case. The resulting cells from meiosis are what we call gametes. The word gamete is a thing. Gam means marriage. So these are things that marry. Well, what's marriage? When two things become one. Oh, it's so beautiful. That's what gamete means. They're cells that marry each other. They fuse. In, for the sake of saying it, animals, we say sperm and egg. In plants, we say sperm and egg. We talk fungi, we say plus and minus gametes because they look the same. Why do we use sperm and egg? Because we can visually tell them apart. Egg, big. Sperm, tiny. Egg sits there. Sperm goes to egg. But in these cases, everything's moving all over the place. So we do change the terminology for the gametes. So just for the sake of the terminology, because this gets really bad, and I know that you can't read any of it, but I did bring a marker. So when we have the two sets of Xs, we call those homologous pairs of chromosomes or homologs. Each X is what we call a chromosome, but each side is a sister chromatid. But the moment I separate these sister chromatids, meaning if I were to make a cell with one line, one line, one line, and one line, we now just say the word chromosome. We no longer use the word chromatid, which is kind of really annoying. The word chromatid is only used when you have the X. So from S phase until we separate in anaphase, we use the word chromatid. But outside of that, we never use the word again. Meiosis 1 is not like meiosis 2, and it's not like mitosis. And there turn out to be some really big differences that occur in meiosis 1. So that's what we're going to kind of focus on. Because everything else, it looks the exact same. We have a prophase, metaphase, and anaphase, a telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. OK, it's like this hit repeat. And if I look, anaphase is a separation. Anaphase is a separation. Telophase is they're far apart. Cytokinesis is you split the cell. Metaphase, metaphase. They're kind of stuck in the middle. The words keep being the same. The major difference is what's going on in prophase. The prophase is really different between the two. And the setup of prophase in meiosis 1 makes it behave differently throughout the rest of meiosis 1. The setup of prophase 2 makes it behave like mitosis. The first thing that we're going to see in prophase 1 is we're going to pair up the chromosomes. So the goal of meiosis 1 is we're going to separate the homologous pairs. The only way you're going to separate them is if you stick them together. So we know that everyone's paired up. So if the homologs are paired up, I can then separate them during anaphase. But I, that only works if they're paired up. In other classes, so if you take developmental biology, which is 433, so this would be in a year or two, 
you'll learn that prophase one is actually divided into five subphases because we describe each of the steps going on in what I'm about to say in a big sweeping statement. Because there are places where it goes wrong. So we subdivide it so we can give a name to all the points. When we stick those homologous pairs of chromosomes together, we call that a tetrad. Tetrad, what the? If I look at this homologous pair, how many lines do you see between them all? Between those, you have how many? Four. What's four in Latin? Tetra. Hence, it's a tetrad. I have four lines. I have four complete strips of DNA. I have four chromatids. That's what we call a tetrad. Synapsis means come together. So when they've come together, synapsis, you have four lines, four complete pieces of DNA or a tetrad. I did warn you that the terminology is going to be like a, I don't like any of this. The words make sense. It's just, it's a lot of words. The thing about DNA is DNA gets confused easily. And if you have similar DNA near similar DNA, sometimes it forgets which side it belongs to. And what you can get is the DNA will snap and trade spots. So we can get DNA on one chromosome to swap parts or swap locations with DNA on the other chromosome, on the, homo on the homologous chromosome. Meaning some of that blue DNA will swap places with the red DNA. When it swaps over, it makes an X shape. Who's in 260? Those of you who are in 260, name me the Greek letter that's an X. Chi. Chi asthma. We call it a chiasma because it's an X shape. So chiasmata just means more than one. Chiasma is one, chiasmata would be two or three or whatever. So those X shapes are where the DNA is swapping locations. This is the first big difference between meiosis and mitosis. So actually, no, second big difference. First big difference, we pair up the chromosomes. Second big difference, we trade parts. There's a lot going on here. Like we have to glue the pieces together, which is the synaptodemal complex. So it's just holding them together to make sure that this process occurs. The implication for us in genetics about this event where they swap parts or where you have a crossing over because you cross from one side to the other is it requires you to remember like what's what's the point mitosis we're trying to make identical daughter cells but in meiosis we're trying to make genetically distinct haploid daughter cells genetically distinct means all of them are different every cell that you produce should be unique no repeats whatsoever one of the ways that we can do that is let's shuffle the parts. We're going to make it so you start with mom's set of chromosomes and dad's set of chromosomes. What comes out of you is a blending of mom's chromosomes and dad's chromosomes. So that you can't take one of your chromosomes and say, which one is it? It's both. Your chromos When you have kids, if you have kids, better thing to say if you ever have kids the chromosome one you're going to give to a child is not from your dad and it's not from your mom it's a mixture of both of them 
The chromosome X, that, actually X and Y are here. Chromosome 22 is going to be a blending of your dad's and your mom's 22 is what you would be giving to a future child. And that's because we're trying to make genetically distinct offspring. And every chromosome one you give up is going to be different. It's going to be a different way that we mix and match the parts. What we end up forming, these chromosomes that have mix and match parts are called recombinant chromosomes. That recombination results from what we call that crossing over event, where they swap parts. I know there's a lot of words. We have chiasmata, we have synapsis, we have tetrads, we have recombination, we have crossing over. They're all different ways of describing the same event. Up until three years ago, we couldn't have told you what gene controls this. We knew it happened, but we had no clue what gene did it. The first paper came out in 2022, which means it was the study was done before that. And it was studied in Arabidopsis. So we know what it is in Arabidopsis. We don't know what it is in us. And it turns out that with this gene, if you make it so the gene doesn't work, the cell dies. And if you make it work too well, meaning you do a whole bunch of these crossing over events, you destroy all the chromosomes. They literally shred apart. So it's a, oh, it kind of is a big deal to make sure that this thing happens. How often does it happen? Two or three times per homologous pair of chromosomes. It has to be somewhere between two or three. Go to four it starts to fall apart. You go to one, the cell dies. We don't know. There's been one paper that's come out. So there's lots of mysteries still about something that seems so simple. And we're just, we don't know. We, we just don't. So second thing that we now need to worry about, we're going to jump in our minds to, through the end of meiosis one. We're not going to draw it all out. When you take genetics, I'm going to let you know you're going to be asked to draw it all out. So in genetics, we draw out mitosis and we draw out meiosis. Because in, the, in that class, you need to, in your mind, jump around as to what's going on where. Here, we're just hoping that you pass the class and you want to be bio major still. If you really want to understand mitosis and meiosis, you have to draw it out. Staring at pictures, you're just staring at pictures. You're not doing anything. But if you really want to get it, draw the entire thing out. Is it annoying? Absolutely. So in prophase one, I pair up my chromosome. They're going to trade parts. Metaphase one, we'll line them up in the center. Anaphase one, we're going to split the homologs. The question becomes, how do they split? It turns out I have four different ways or four different outcomes of separating just two pairs of chromosomes. Meaning, if I have this bigger pair and this smaller pair, one way I can separate these pairs after anaphase one is I can have all the blues on one side and all the reds on the other side. That's one possibility. So that's two choices. But what if, what if the blue ones were on opposite sides when they pair up and the reds are on opposite sides when they pair up? What if? Well, after I separate these in meiosis one, I'll have a big blue and a small red in one choice and a big red and a small blue on the other side. I have one, two, three, four possible arrangements of two pairs of chromosomes. Do any of you know how many pairs of chromosomes we have? Because I've hinted at it, I just never said it. We have 23. 
So that's 2 to the 23rd power. It's about 8.5 million different combinations of just how do we pair up the chromosomes. The result of that is you can make on your own with no other of this weird recombination business 8.5 million unique gametes. And that's just off of rearranging the chromosomes. If you couple this in with recombination where you're shuffling the chromosome parts around, you can literally make trillions of different combinations. And if you're making trillions of combinations and your partner is making trillions of combinations, you make combinations between the two of you potentially to be numbers out of 10 to the 24th, which are massive, massive numbers. This simple, those two simple acts, first simple act, swap parts. Second simple act, rearrange how you are during metaphase can literally make trillions of options. And that's just with us. What if you have a, an organism that has more than 46 chromosomes? It becomes endless as to what the diversity turns out to be. You then take this and the fact that DNA mutates every time it replicates. No wonder why evolution happens. Because it's nothing but options. And you're just hoping that some combination is going to work because these processes have built into them combinations. I know I didn't really run all the way through meiosis because the details aren't important for us. I just want you to pick up on those two big facts. Actually, a handful of big facts. Meiosis, we have two phases. So meiosis has two rounds. We pair up the chromosomes, they recombine, then we separate the sister chromatids. If I were to compare these back and forth with mitosis, we have our chromosomes, meiosis, we have our chromosomes. Meiosis, we're going to pair them up. Mitosis, we don't care, we'll just line them up. So we'll line up all the chromosomes, we'll line up the pairs of chromosomes. In meiosis, when they're paired up, they swap parts two or three times each. Ultimately, what we'll do is we just go judo chop right down the center and we split them in half. Because anaphase is the key. Did you cut them down the middle correctly? We'll make this daughter cell and this daughter cell and they'll turn out to be perfectly identical to each other. In meiosis, we're gonna separate the pairs and then we're going to run through basically this, where we just separate the chromatids. And the result is we're going to make four completely unique daughter cells, or gametes. The big deal. On exam four, I would not ask you to draw out mitosis or meiosis. Because, like I said, that's what we're going to do to you in genetics. So I'm letting you know now, it's coming. Just not yet. But would I expect you to be able to compare and contrast? Absolutely. Help you out? Let's do a little bit more. For both mitosis and meiosis, you have to replicate your DNA. So it turns out that has to happen. Mitosis has one division. Meiosis has two divisions. Mitosis does not have any of that synapsis stuff. We never pair up the chromosomes. We have no crossing over. There are no tetrads. There is no recombination in mitosis. In meiosis, only during the first half. Meiosis 1, we'll get that to happen. Meiosis 2 shouldn't be happening. In terms of the outcomes, mitosis should make two identical cells. Meiosis... You're going to make four haploids, and they should all be unique. They shouldn't match each other, and they shouldn't match you, the parent. 
What's it good for? Mitosis is a form of asexual reproduction. So any of your cells that you need, it, needs, it should be made asexually because you don't want different combinations of chromosomes in all your cells. You want them all to be the same. So making your entire body is mitosis. In some animals, this is how they reproduce. So there are animals that only reproduce through mitosis. They do not go through meiosis. Meiosis is necessary for sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, the point of sexual reproduction is to make genetically distinct offspring, is to not make clones. Mitosis makes clones. Myo mitosis makes clones. Meiosis produces unique next generations. The point of unique next generations is to survive. Because we don't know what the environment's going to throw at us. So you're hoping if you make enough choices, one of them's going to work. Well, hopefully more than one, because then it goes into mitosis mode, and that's going to suck. So how does meiosis increase that genetic diversity? So here we're going to switch our focus from molecules to you. So we're now we're going to start talking about organisms, not DNA, RNA, protein, histones, chromatin, stuff like that. We don't even care that, about cells. We're bypassing all of that. So genes are always going to be found in pairs where alleles are going to be dominant or recessive. And they segregate during reproduction and independently assort when examining two or more genes. Genetics involves probability, including ands, ors, and the all of the above option. For those of you who are not in biostats, we're going to do a very fast biostats for you. For those of you who are like, oh no, oh no. In the big genetics class, we were doing, we've been doing chi-squares for about six weeks, and then we've been dropping t-tests and ANOVAs on them. Yeah. Except that on tests and quizzes, I can't expect them to do that, so they have to be able to interpret outcomes. Like, if I give them an R script and a printout, they have to interpret it. I don't make them do it. Except for homework. Homework, I totally do. So... Everyone's heard of this guy named Mendel. Who cares? Whatever. He worked with peas because he couldn't get the job he wanted, and he examined seven traits. Why seven traits? We think, we have no evidence to support this, but we think because he fudged his numbers. What we think happened is he probably examined more than seven traits and realized that some of these didn't make for pretty outcomes, and he was like... Swept it under the rug and said, look at my data. Aren't they so pretty? Which is kind of suspect because when you look at peas, there's other really cool traits. That's like, why didn't you look at those? Because they didn't give the pretty outcomes that his data gave us. So you know, um, this first big old long sentence, most of it is wrong. Just letting you know, most of it turns out to be wrong. But according to Mendel, nailed it. That's why we think he fudged his numbers. So, he ended up coming up with three basic laws. And each of these laws is wrong. Why do we teach it? Because sometimes we have to start with the lie and then walk our way into the truth. Because the lie is easier than the truth. In 370, we go into the truth, and it makes them say, I don't like the truth. And even then, we're avoiding a lot of truth. So what he noticed with these three laws is genes have to be paired up. We know this because you have a copy from mom and a copy from dad. We ultimately said that you can have versions of your genes, and we call those versions 
alleles. So if you have a gene for flower color, you can have an allele that says the flower color is purple, and you can have an allele for the flower color that is white. So the same gene, flower color, but we have two choices, purple or white. We call those choices alleles. He ended up dropping all sorts of terminology. So I've hinted at this, but a gene is the info for a trait. For our purposes, we're going to say that one trait equals one gene. And because I said for our purposes, you know I am lying to you. But for right now, I am speaking the truth. He used terminology called pure breeding. The word cross means make them replicate, make them mate. So he would cross pure breeding plants in what was known as the P generation. P meaning parental, not P as in the plant. What this would end up producing is what were known as hybrid F1s. F stands for filial. Filial meaning brotherhood, like a fraternity. Or a Philadelphia, brotherly love. If you cross the F1 generation, you can make F2 if you wanted. And you can take the F2 and cross them and make an F3 and cross the F3 and make an F4. And you can keep doing this forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So it begs the question of, where's the P generation? Wherever you want it to be. The P generation is where you're starting. But since you're doing the problem and you're doing the experiment, the P generation is when you say, this is my P generation. And then the F1, F2 just follows from it. So it is not an absolute P generation F1, F2. It's when you want to say and invoke the terms is when you start arranging. So you know, the F1 only is the offspring from the P generation. It does not mean you bring in outsiders. So this entire process is an inbreeding process. In which case you say, you. If you look at humans, we are inbred. You say, that, no, that's not true. It's like, go back a thousand years, we are inbred. Why? Because... We lived in little cities and towns, and you got to pick from what was there for generation after generation, which means we all sit there and look at our cousins and go, yeah. <laughs> it's a relatively modern phenomenon of us running away. So some of these weird words. Pure breeding is what we would call being homozygous. What we mean by homozygous is your copies, because remember, everything shows up in pairsies, are the same. Homozygous means the zygote, the baby, the you, is the same. So for the gene, you have the same alleles. Hybrid means heterozygous. So your alleles are different. What we end up seeing when we look at whatever the gene does is referred to as the phenotype. So the phenotype for flower color, in this case, would be purple. The phenotype for this flower, in this case, would be white. So the phenotype is what you see. What Mendel introduced to us is the idea of the genotype, which is the allele combination. That is when we get to use the words homozygous or heterozygous. 
So homozygous and heterozygous reference genotypes. They do not reference phenotypes. Because all you know is you're looking, you just say what you see. As a brief aside, we know that mutations exist. And if a gene has no mutations and it's going to get fully transcribed and fully translated, it should work. And then the gene should do whatever it's supposed to do. Meaning if you have a piece of DNA, which is the gene, and it's coding for, a pig for the enzyme that makes the purple pigment, if you fully transcribe that piece of DNA, that piece of RNA is translated, that enzyme folds correctly, it should make the purple pigment. So if everything's going right, I should make the proper gene product, and that proper gene product will give me the, quote, correct phenotype. If, however, you have a mutation in just the right location of that gene so that the mRNA has a screwed up codon that puts in the really wrong amino acid that disrupts the active site so the enzyme can't do its job, the result is that enzyme cannot produce the purple color. And if you can't produce the purple color, we get a different phenotype. So we have some versions of genes where we're going to get the, quote, correct phenotype. And we have other versions where you just don't. And it's just how it is. Sometimes the mutations don't do anything, and sometimes the mutations do do stuff. Oh, well. It all depends on... Where's the mutation? With that, we can explain Mendel's little phenomenon that we call dominance. What he observed is you could take a pure breeding line. So if I were to take pure breeding purple and pure breeding white, and if I cross them, I'm going to get pure breeding purple. So here's my P generation. Here are my F1. I'm going to let the F1 mate with itself. And what I will get and the outcome will be purple flowers, but also some white ones. That meant that the white coloration is hiding inside of the F1. It's hidden in there. That allele that made the white coloration hides behind the allele that makes the purple color. We call that a dominant recessive relationship, where the purple, if paired up, so if you have a combination of purple and white for your genotype, the purple stands in front of the white. Well, that's a aggressive move, a dominant move. So we call that allele the dominant allele. And the one that hides is recalled the recessive allele. It does not disappear. It just hides. But in a future generation, it can reemerge. This was radical at the time. Because what most people thought happened, we knew of sperm, we knew of egg. And what a good chunk of people thought was inside that sperm and inside that egg was a baby human. And what happened is those baby humans fused together and you made a blending of the two. And voila, that's the kid. It was just a weird blending. How does it happen? I don't know, just a blending. This is saying it's not really a blending. It's just combinations of pieces. But pieces stay there. You don't lose anything. They don't merge together and make something brand new. You have the pieces and they just hang out. And you can fetch some of them back out in the next generation. It was a radical idea. Mendel was a contemporary of Darwin. Darwin believed in the egg and sperm had baby humans and they kind of fused together thing. They never spoke to each other. It would have totally changed everything about Darwin's book if they spoke, but oops. 
so, that's a different question. So as I'm presenting it here, yes, but that's not necessarily true. So there are dominant alleles that are actually the mutations. It just depends on the situation. So for our purposes here, if it functions, we call it dominant. And if it doesn't function, we call it recessive. For our purposes. Again, not entirely true. But let's run with it, just because. Because, yes, there are exceptions. The most famous exception I'm thinking of is called achondroplasia. Achondroplasia is caused by a single dominant allele. The allele turns out to be the mutation. Achondroplasia, the word itself, which is a horrible word, means you can't form cartilage. Because plasia is make, chondro is cartilage. A means don't, so you don't make cartilage. What does that mean? The way your bones lengthen is you have cartilage at the ends. You called them when you were six, or at least your parents called them when you were six, your growth plates. What happens is the cartilage stretches on out, and then you fill it in with bone. And that's how your limbs got longer and your legs got longer. This is a different story. It's, it's done a different way. But these are elongate that way. You have achondroplasia. This works normally, but these stay short. So you can now imagine the phenotype of what you look like. That is caused by a single dominant mutation. So there are exceptions to it. We're going to come back to achondroplasia because it turns out to be a unique type of problem. What I can do is if I were to take hybrids and cross them, I can find the recessives. So take two a true breeding purple and a true breeding white, you get a hybrid purple. If I apply symbols to this, I could use big P, big P, capital meaning dominant, lowercases meaning recessive. Because we know that they show up in pairsies, I have two capital P's and two lowercase p's. The hybrid would be one of each, because that's what hybrid means, or heterozygous. It's one of each. If I were to take this and cross it with itself, what I'm going to get is a ratio of three purples to one white. The white is hiding in the F1, so we call that again the recessive. And this ratio of three purples to one white is a statistical ratio. It is not a reality ratio. What I mean by that is if you were to sit there and do this in real life and then count th four seeds from the F2, so crossing F1 to F1 gives you F2, if I take four seeds, is it going to be three purples to one, right, one white? No, you're not going to see that. How if I check 100 of them? Will it be 75 to 25? No, it will not be. How if I do 1,000 of them? Will it be 750 to 250? No, it won't be. It will be close, but it won't be. What statistical test would I use to check it? Where I'm checking counts of, I expect this count, but I observe this count. That is the chi-square. Or at least the expectations chi-square, not the odds ratio one. That Odds ratios are weird. That's for medicine. But we could test it using chi-squares. This is, can only be explained if your alleles show up, in, if genes show up in pairs. So you have two alleles. And that's how Mendel came to his two copies thing. There's another type of cross that happens. How do I know if you're pure breeding or not? So we have something that's referred to as a test cross. If the genotype is two capital P's, we would call you purple. The catch is, 
If you're heterozygous, you're also purple. So how would I know what you turn out to be? Are you this one or are you that one? Are you homozygous or are you heterozygous? If you look, you cannot tell them apart. So Mendel came up with something called the test cross. A test cross is when you take the dominant, the purple, and you purposely cross it with the recessive, which in this case would be the white. All I know, if you're dominant, is you have one capital P. I don't know what your other allele is. But if I cross you with the recessive, I can find out. If any of the offspring from this test cross happen to be recessive, the parent has to be heterozygous. Because it's the only way to make that an outcome. If you have no recessive offspring, and I don't mean after like two of them, I mean after hundreds of them, then you, then you know that the parent is homozygous. So we have little tricks from the past that we could figure out homozygous versus heterozygous. It just takes time to figure it out. Nowadays, we just sequence your DNA and we move on. So nowadays, it's easy. This will be the last slide. Genes also do this weird thing called independent assortment. This only works when we're talking about two or more genes. It does not apply to one gene. This is a two or more genes phenomenon. Mendel stopped with two. But we can do this with all of your genes, with all 25,000 of them. Or, that's not right, 22,000 of them, roughly. Except that with 22,000, this isn't true anymore. But So we know that they segregate, meaning the alleles split. We get a splitting of the alleles. Because it's the only way to explain that weird 3 to 1 ratio thing. So what Mendel came up with is one gene segregation has nothing to do with another gene segregation. So how the purple color segregates has nothing to do with where those flowers are located. They have nothing to do with each other. In this particular case here, whether the fruit is round or wrinkled, or if it's yellow or if it's green, they have nothing to do with each other. And because round versus wrinkled, yellow versus green have nothing to do with each other, we're making different sets of combinations that are possible. And we call those assortments. The different final results are different. I can come up with more than just two choices. I come up with, in fact, four choices. And those four choices are the assortments. This is shown most famously in this thing here that's called a dihybrid cross. And it yields a ratio that's called the 9331 ratio. When we come back, what we're going to be doing in class is working problems. We're going to first, I'm going to briefly talk about how we would set these up. You're going to do an activity, so you need to find a group of three other people to work with. You're also going to need a calculator. And between the four of you, someone needs to have a computer access that you can get onto an Excel spreadsheet and type in numbers. Because we're going to collect data in real time to test some stuff. I'll see you on Monday.